Columbia Launch Director. Go ahead. Okay, Rick, if there's ever a time to use the phrase, uh, all good things come to people who wait, and this is one time. And uh, for the, you and your crew, best of luck on this mission, and from the many, many people who put this mission together, good luck and Godspeed. Oh, we appreciate it, Mike. The Lord has blessed us with a beautiful day here, and uh, we're going to have a great mission. We appreciate all the great hard work everybody's put into this, and we're ready to go. Copy that. NTD with that, you're clear to launch. I copy that. Thank you, sir. CLSS go for orbiter access arm recheck. CDR, OTC. OTC, CDR, go. Rick, from our crew to yours, best wishes on your international mission to explore the science, peace, and potential that only space travel can offer. Well, we thank you very much, uh, Ray, and uh, thanks for all the great work from uh, your team and all the other folks here. Columbia for the flight crew, closed and lock your visors and initiate O2 Club. T minus two minutes and counting. Thanks a million. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. We have a go for main engine start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. Houston now controlling the flight of Columbia, the international research mission finally underway. Roger, roll, Columbia. Com Columbia now rolling on to the proper azimuth for a 39 degree inclination to orbit. Shuttle in a heads down wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. 30 seconds into the flight, the three liquid fuel main engines beginning to throttle back in a three-step fashion to 72% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. These are Columbia's crewmen. Uh, Commander Rick Husband is, is reclining here. We've got uh, payload special, uh, excuse me, mission specialist uh, Mike Anderson. Pilot Willie McCool, Dave Brown, Elon Ramon, who was Israel's first astronaut, uh, Laurel Clark, and Casey Chavla, who was an Indian-born uh, American citizen. So yeah, we met uh, uh, Norm Carlson had been the launch uh, test conductor for Apollo in the uh, early part of the shuttle era, and Norm had always told me that Mike Leinbach was the best hire he'd ever made. I never got a chance to meet Mike, but uh, Norm passed away before the Apollo books were done, and I saw Mike, I recognized him at Norm's funeral, and went over and introduced myself. And we went out and had lunch a couple weeks later, and one thing led to another, as they say. Did you always want to do this book, Mike? I, you know, I'd started thinking about doing the book about 10 years ago, and, and I didn't have the discipline to carry through, and, and uh, so I, I knew we wanted to tell the story of all the people that helped us find Columbia and the crew and, and, and bring them home. Uh, so yeah, I, I had, had wanted to do the book for a while, and then with Jonathan Self, it, it all came together. You know, I think one of the, the benefits of having had the time pass now with, with doing this 15 years later, a lot of the books that came out about Columbia came out within a year of the accident, and so it was very difficult to kind of put into context what actually happened to the rest of the space shuttle program and the American space program as a result of what happened on Columbia. So now this has given us kind of the, the benefit of being able to, to put the accident into context. What do you hope? the public takes away from reading this story? I hope they get out, out, of, the, out of the story that the good people in East Texas and around the country that helped us find Columbia and the crew, it was uh, 25,000 people helped us find it. Uh, volunteers and, and some paid folks, just an enormous workforce that was coming together seamlessly. Over 100 different agencies from the federal, state, and local agencies and volunteer agencies. Everybody working together with a common goal of, of finding the crew and the, and the orbiter and bringing it home. 
and, and they did it out of the goodness of their hearts and, and uh, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't want anything in return other than knowing they were helping NASA and their country and then eventually getting back to space flight again. What challenges do you think launch directors for future commercial crew and Orion missions will face? Uh, any launch director is going to face the same, the same issues. Uh, my job as a launch director was to keep that vehicle on the ground. My job was to not launch the shuttle until everything was absolutely as best as we could possibly make it. And, and that's, the, that's the same spirit that every, every future launch director is going to have to have. You can't get wrapped up in, in, the, in the launch fever at all, where you really want to launch so badly that you, that you forget about the good practices and, 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 uh, of keeping the vehicle on the ground. And as, long, as long as they have that attitude of safety first, keep it on the ground until everything's ready to go, they'll be fine. Did you or any launch directors train alongside shuttle crews? Sure, we train along the, the crews all the time. And in fact, uh, we had dinner with them, we had a, a fellowship with them. They wanted to get to know us, we wanted to get to know them so that on launch day, the astronauts would know who was given the final go, who was putting them at risk. I wanted to know who I was giving the final go to. Uh, these were real people with real families and real kids, and, and uh, so I, I wanted to get to know them on a personal level. So when I made that final decision about launch or don't launch, they were human to me. They weren't, they weren't astronauts. They were human beings with real families, and, and uh, that's how I made my final decision. I had, I had all the computer programs in the world and all the data you could possibly imagine. I made my final decision on launching based on the fact that I had seven friends on top of that vehicle, and I wasn't going to let them go until I was convinced myself in my gut that it was safe. What involvement did you have in TCDT process, and how did TCDT like change or evolve over time throughout the program? TCDT, the Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test, was, was really a, about a week-long activity when the astronauts would come to town and train with us, with the launch team and the processing team and the engineering team, uh, and, and also get to know each other. Uh, that started early, early on in the America's Manned Spaceflight Program. That there was always the need to get the astronauts in town to practice on the flight hardware, to practice getting in, the, the, in our case, the orbiter or the, or the Mercury or the Gemini or the Apollo capsule, practice launch pad activities so that on, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a practice sense, in a training sense, so that on the real launch day, it wasn't new to them. They had already done it, and so they, they, we had to get that training under their belt. And that, that, uh, that was the genesis of the Terminal Countdown Demonstration Center. And how did your role change, if at all, after Columbia? Well, my role changed a lot after 9-11. After we had the increased security on, on shuttle launches, um, something we never got into before. Before 9-11, uh, before uh, security on launch day was, was mainly aimed at protecting the public from our rockets not the other way around. Yeah. And so it, that changed significantly since 9-11. Since Columbia, I, I have to say, I, I took even a greater sense of, of a personal need to know the astronauts so that I could give that final go. I, I, I knew them before Columbia. I knew the seven Columbia astronauts well. But I, I, I must say, after Columbia, I, I got to know the crews even better so I could give that final gut check go. So you made it a point to make sure that you meet them all and make it as personal as you could before you send them to space. You betcha. That was, that was my job. My job was to not launch the vehicle. And then when I did, I was launching my friends, and I wasn't going to do that unless I was convinced everything was as good as we could possibly make it. Okay. And with commercial companies taking over now, um, for any SpaceX employees or Boeing employees who are going to be you know, they're the next generation, they're my age, 20s, 30s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have anything to say to them as they build these capsules that we're going to put our astronauts back on here very soon? The, the only piece of advice I had for them, frankly, is, is just remember the astronauts are real people. They're, they're, not, uh, they're not gods, they're not anything special <laughs> from, a, from a personal standpoint. They have families, they have kids, they have parents. And as long as you remember that and do everything you can to keep them safe, they'll, they'll be fine. And what advice would, just from your experience, what advice would you have for them in the future and when they face adversity too, if they lose a crew or something goes wrong, um, what, would you, what would be your advice to them? 
Same same thing we did in Shovel after we lost Challenger in Columbia. We, we found a problem, we fixed it, and we flew again. And that was that was our mantra after both those accidents. And, and so we have to figure out what went wrong, fix it, and get back on the horse. And, and that's uh, that's what the next generation is going to have to do. There will be more failures. I hope it doesn't result in loss of life. There will sure. be more failures. And, 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 Failure in and of itself is not bad. You learn a lot from the failure, as long as you don't hurt anybody. Uh, have your failure, learn from it, and press on. We've already had the loss of, of a Virgin Galactic pilot. Yep. yep. Yeah. That's and, true. Uh, yeah, and they're learning from that. I mean, it, it could have been easy for Branson just to, just to cancel everything at that point, but he decided to press on. Press on. Yeah. Press and then, on. John, um, as I might asked Mike a little while ago, what do you hope? the public and readers take away from this story? Well, I, again, I think this is its one of those things to me was very heartening was that uh, Americans could come together uh, and basically put, I, I don't think there was any kind of issue about any, any personal differences that came up at all in this thing. Everybody pitched in and did exactly the right thing that needed to happen. Uh, you know, we uh, we let people do what they what they wanted to do to help out. We didn't get in their way, um, and people found creative ways to step way above the call uh, of their either their pay grade, their official jobs, or even uh, help out in any way they could. Whether it was serving tea in the VFW hall to volunteer uh, to firefighters, or to being out there in the briars and the mud and, and things and searching for the, the crew members, uh, we could NASA couldn't have asked for better people to help um, to help with this this. Kind of uh, search and uh, it just it was a, for me a very heartwarming story even though I know it's a very sad story but I think out, out of this there's a very positive message that people can do the right thing and want to help out however they can uh, everybody that I talk to no matter what role they played in this view this as being you know a seminal moment in their life this was something that to them they felt like was one of the best things they ever did with their lives and they were proud to have played it <laughs> part of it.